Let's go. Let's go. Oh, no. Do you want to? I'll let you. I'll let you. Next one. I'm excited and I feel relaxed and I'm ready to party. Don't say sorry. You don't need to do that. You don't need to apologize. It's a fucked up female habit. You don't need to be sorry for anything ever. Can you guess what every woman's worst nightmare is? I don't have rage issues! I have nothing to prove to you. When I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. I say when it comes to stardom and Lauren, there are no accidents. Hi, Karen Peterson. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Citizen Dame, the podcast where we are fucking cold. <laughs> uh, I, I am Lauren Humphreys Brooks. With me, as always, is Karen Peterson. Hello, Karen. Hello. Are you cold, Karen? Because I'm cold. I am cold. I'm definitely not as cold <laughs> as you, but when it's 46 degrees in California, that is really cold. <laughs> 46 degrees i dream of 46 degrees i would go outside in my shorts and 46 degrees <laughs> when i was a child 46 degrees was barefoot weather no that's not true um but yeah it's it's, it's definitely not 46 here yeah uh, yeah <laughs> but you did just come back from someplace very cold so i sure did that as well i did my coat definitely got well used. <laughs> so we are actually going to talk about Karen's exciting experience at uh, at Sundance this this year because that was why we were off for the last couple of weeks. Karen was partying it up um, at the Sundance Film Festival and like just you know going out raging, like going to raves, <laughs> having a great time. I don't know what the kids do at Sundance, but I'm assuming it's that. They didn't um, have the pot party this year. I was so sad. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if they did or not. Maybe I just didn't get invited after what happened last time, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> we just know you're a rager, Karen. Like, it's no, a thing I gotta, that I know about. I gotta keep you the know. mystery alive. I was hoping you wouldn't tell people. <laughs> Um, it's a C I'm sorry. That was a secret. I've, I've outed you. <laughs> uh, but before we talk about Sundance, um, which I think is going to take up a lot of this episode, but we wanted to discuss briefly some of the things that have happened, uh, in the past couple of weeks since Karen has been gone. And since I have gotten to, you know, sleep until noon on Saturdays, <laughs> Uh, and I think the the big one was definitely the Oscar announcements and all of the things that are, that have been surrounding um, the Oscars, especially the Andrea Riceboro um, uh, nomination, which has been scrutinized and was like a whole big story. And I don't know if it's necessarily a big story to anyone who doesn't pay attention to this stuff. That was one of the things that uh, a number of people kept on saying on Twitter, like, because because a lot of entertainment outlets were covering it and were talking about it. And this was like a big thing. And several people were like, does anyone not like outside of the film entertainment sphere either know or care about this? Because it seems very internal in, in a certain sense. Because uh, honestly, like a lot of people haven't seen the movie that she's even nominated for. I haven't. I didn't know. I didn't know she was in a movie this year <laughs> until this whole thing actually happened. And I am within the the Twitter the Twitterverse entertainment sphere, etc. Um, but this was kind of an interesting one. Yeah, well, this is something that started a couple of weeks before the nominations where it, it like within the last probably two weeks before the nomination ballots were due all of a sudden um i i honestly thought the whole thing was a joke because i saw a bunch of tweets where it was like oh so and so now so now says you should vote for andrea riseborough for two leslie and i was seeing all these tweets from people that i follow who were mm -hmm. making it seem like it's just this like wouldn't this be hilarious if this happened, you know, type of thing? I was like, what the hell is too Leslie? I didn't even think it was a real movie at first. And, <laughs> and this was going on. And then, of course, like, you know, on the eve of Oscar nominations, there was this like, what if that really worked? And and then it did. It happened. And immediately the outcry from people who had been retweeting this stuff in the last couple of weeks, all of a sudden were like, oh my gosh, this is robbery. This is terrible. This shouldn't have happened. I can't believe this. And, mm -hmm. um, and really, I mean, the 
conventional wisdom, as you say, to the people who follow this stuff and who actually pay attention ahead of time to what could and sometimes should be nominated for awards, uh, Danielle Deadweiler looked like mm-hmm. she was pretty strongly, she was a strong contender for the movie Till. And so it seemed very much like this was a spot that should have gone to her. Viola Davis also got shut out, but that entire movie did too. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to say for sure, like if she really stole someone's spot, if it, and if she did, was it one of theirs? Um, but this movie really did just kind of come out of nowhere, and it was this grassroots campaign. And because of the fact that it was a movie that has only, at this point, to date, has only grossed about $28,000, <laughs> and most people most people still don't even know it exists and if they do if they've heard the title they have no idea what it's about um Mm -hmm. you know it's it's an interesting thing so of course all eyes turn to andrea riseborough then it becomes what did you do you know you stole (laughs) this spot from these other deserving actresses and it's like but did she steal the spot yeah or what else was going on here so yeah, well, I, I, I think that there are sev- there, there are definitely several things happening here. One is the question about this whole grassroots campaign, right? Because this was very word of mouth. Like I say, I hadn't heard of this film or, or anything. And then suddenly everybody began talking about Andrea Riceborough. And I was honestly like, wait, who's Andrea Riceborough? <laughs> and she's a good actress. And according to like most people who have seen this film, it's a good film. She does. And she gives a good performance in it. Um, so maybe she does deserve the the not, uh, lead actress nod, but there was that combination of things happening where you had this, which seems like this total like out of left field. Where is this coming from? Why is this even a part of the conversation? Because it hadn't been a part of the conversation, right? Right. Um, on on the one side, and then on the other side, you have people like um, uh, Danielle Deadweiler and Viola Davis getting locked out and and then yeah we and then we begin having conversations about like well you know what does that what does that mean exactly and i a number of very good articles actually appeared about this fairly quickly too which i i was really glad to see um one of them by by your friend clayton davis and uh another by our patron robert daniels um and and both of them focused on the fact that this that the argument about Riceboro is there's a bigger argument that really needs to be had, and it doesn't have anything to do with Riceboro locking out Daniel Deadweiler, um, Danielle Deadweiler, or uh, Viola Davis, but in actually the way that the Oscars in particular have locked out Black women. Right. And, and that's one of the things, and they both wrote fantastic articles that actually go into, you know, the, the whole, the systemic racism that we know of, the systemic racism and the systemic sexism of the Academy nominations that have nothing to do with, you know, whether or not Andrea Riceborough deserves, doesn't deserve, should have been campaigning the way that she was, shouldn't have been campaigning the way that she was. The fact that, you know, these women and not just these lead actresses, but also uh, Gina Prince Blythewood, also um, Alice Diop, uh, who, who released film St. Omer, those, those women are getting locked out of their categories. And black women have been locked out of their category of, of categories for a very, very long time, right? Um, and I think that Robert points out the fact that only one film directed by a black woman, Salma, directed by uh, Avi DuVernay, re- has received a Best Picture nomination. Mm-hmm. That's the only film. And that's, and of course, the argument is always just like, well, obviously black women just don't direct good films, just like bullshit. No, that's, if you know anything <laughs> about film, you should know that that isn't true. Right. Um, and, and so the problem is that then the, particularly the Riceboro thing, I think because the Riceboro thing happened at the same time, we've got these two conversations that are kind of getting muddled together and it turns into what is essentially the scapegoating of Riceboro Mm -hmm. as an excuse for the Academy's, um, the Academy's racism and the Academy's sexism. Yeah. And and you've got so we've got all of these combinations of things that are going on that are making this this Oscar season in particular very fraught Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 problematic. And I think that we're not we're still really not addressing 
the the actual problem right yeah and and here's the thing like in the case specifically of viola davis and danielle deadweiler a lot of people believed that they were getting in one or both of them but um i don't i am not like an authority i mean i'm i you know i'm pretty smart about this stuff but you know i've never gotten 100 percent on my predictions ever um But it's interesting because I really did not think that Viola Davis was going to make it. I was listening to the way people talked about the woman King. I was watching the way it really seemed to be trailing off in terms of, you know, the films that that voters and people in those circles were talking about. And so I just didn't believe that Viola Davis was happening. Um, In the case of Danielle Deadweiler, I also saw her as very vulnerable because a that movie is very difficult to watch she's phenomenal in it she's absolutely so good but that movie is really difficult to watch and when you go into it knowing it's very difficult subject a lot of people just weren't picking it up and if she had been nominated she would have been the sole representative of that movie nobody was talking about it anywhere else nobody was talking about it for costumes or hair and makeup or production design or anything or any of her co-stars none of that so it was really just that that film rested on her. And when not an, when I really thought not a lot of voters were going to actually seek it out and watch it, I thought, you know, and I even had conversations with people who are well placed to have even more of these conversations. Um, and we were all in agreement that out of everybody that was like the conventional, you know, assumed nominees, she was the most vulnerable. And so because film Twitter doesn't like to understand or doesn't doesn't seem to get that, you know, there's no such thing as a lock until the nominations actually happen. Um, it looked like she swooped in and stole this, you know, very secure spot. But from my perspective and from the perspective of people who really do, you know, have a certain level of experience on this it was never locked in the first place and so poor andrea riseborough and i don't know how involved she was in this or not so i say poor andrea riseborough like with a you know (laughs) with tongue in cheek but uh i don't know how involved she was in this campaign or if this was just some friends working on her behalf behind the scenes like we're gonna get this done and now she's bearing the brunt of it for something that a she didn't mm-hmm. steal because it wasn't anybody's to steal and b because of the circumstances in which it happened and really like i really liked you know what clayton and robert both said and some other folks have written about this too and i really appreciated their point that this is much more than the 1302 members of the uh, of the actors branch mm-hmm. this is an entire system And if Gina Prince Bythewood had been nominated for Best Director, if The Woman King had been nominated in Best Picture, if, you know, and going even beyond Black women, if Nope had been nominated for stuff, you know, Jordan Peele's film, if if Nanny had, if, um, you know, some of these, you know, there's so many other options, too. If any of those films had been seriously considered and taken seriously, by the guilds along the way and you know it would have been that much more um i don't know it just it, the the Oscars, it would have had, oh sorry it would have had more momentum yeah yeah exactly yeah and the oscars i mean i i'm not excusing the academy because i think that they have tr- they're, they're trying to make changes but they're not mm-hmm. a it's not happening fast enough and b I don't think that the real changes that need to happen are happening. And I think in some of those cases, it's not going to happen until, sorry to say it, but some of these folks retire or die in the next few years. <laughs> well, I no, it's true. And and I think that's one of the things that both, both Clayton and Robert point out is that the Academy is still overwhelmingly old and overwhelmingly white. Yeah. And changes have happened. And I think that, and we are seeing that, you know, we don't, we shouldn't ignore the fact that, you know, women have won best director oscar two years in a row right Mm -hmm. um and and there are definitely movements forward but when you're talking about the entire scope of cinema right Right. in in a single year and obviously there are films that are deserving that are not going to get in but you look at the nominations this year you even look at the nominations in years past and it's still 
predictable to a certain degree, but it's still very white. It's still very male. Um, and and the the other films that do get in are good and they're shaking things up and as as are the uh, the other like acting, et cetera, nominees. But it's still not like you say, it's still not going far enough. And I, I do think that it's a good point that um, and this is a point that Robert also makes in his article is that most of the actual guilds are not rewarding black women right? right they're so the director so he points out that the director's guild of america has never nominated a black woman in its main feature category um that critics organizations still still struggle with nominating black actresses and um black and black women generally so it's and I think that that's what it comes down to when you're talking about systemic racism and systemic sexism. It's not just talking about the academy per se. It's talking about the entire system. Yeah. Um, and all of these things are a part of the system, right? right. And so, you know, I, I mean, we're we're also talking about the fact that Michelle Yao is uh, the first the first Asian Asian, mm -hmm. right? That's a big. That's a broad category right yeah. there. It's like half um, the population of the world is Asian. Yeah, wo woman to receive a uh, a best actress nomination since Merle Oberon. Merle Oberon, who by the way basically had to conceal her own heritage in order to to be an actress at all, right? Mm -hmm. So so like even Merle Oberon has an asterisk next to her, right? Because a lot of people because people didn't know that she was of Asian descent at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Well, and and the other point that Clayton makes is, and I think Robert did too, where are the grassroots efforts for these women? Like, okay, if the guilds are going yeah. to shut them out, where was the grassroots effort to get Gina a nomination to make sure Danielle got in? Instead, you have this, you know, social media and these emails going around, Francis Fisher emailing people and saying, Pete Hammond, of all people, Pete Hammond is a fucking moron. Sorry, you heard it here. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, saying, oh, he says these people are locked, so you don't have to worry about it. Danielle's getting in. It's like, that's first of all, that that is the violation right there. And that's why the Academy looked into it, because you can't name other um, other contenders. But uh but yeah, like, this is the problem. Like, where's the grassroots effort for Viola to make sure she gets in mm -hmm. or for, you know, Alice Diop or whoever else, you know, there, there isn't, there isn't any, there never is. Well, and, and you're also talking about um, people that have kind of been doing the, the thing that they're supposed to do. They've been campaigning, they've been going to the parties, they've been glad handing, you know, all of those things that we, we view as Oscar, as people who are campaigning for Oscar nominations do as Michelle Yao did, as Kate Blanchett did. Mm -hmm. um, Gina Prince Bythewood went to the part. She, you know, she campaigned basically. Yeah. And they're not getting in and you are and at that point you know and i i i think that was something like i wasn't surprised that the woman king didn't get nominated as as you were um because it like you say it it seemed to not have the momentum behind it it didn't have the conversation behind it um it deserved it mm -hmm. right and so did viola davis and so did gina prince by the way but um I wasn't shocked to see it. And there were a lot of reasons why I wasn't shocked when it didn't come up in any of the nominations. Um, but the problem is the reasons why I weren't shocked is, is, is the issue. Like the, the, the fact that this is a black centered narrative, that it's a black female centered narrative, that it is a film made by black women, that it's about colonialism that is not from the perspective of a white dude. Right. Um, that doesn't have a white character with whom we sympathize and follow through his realization that co that colonialism is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of those things and watching that film, just like this film is absolutely should be in the same conversation with all of the other Best Picture nominees this year, but it's not going to be. Right. Um, and there are some pretty clear reasons as to why not. And that, again, comes back to systemic racism and systemic sexism. So, yeah, all, all of this, I think, comes down to the fact that Andrea Riceboro did not steal a nomination. The Academy and the system refused to give the nominations to these yep. women. Exactly. 
I mean, we should also note, I don't think a single woman got a nomination for Best Director this year. That is correct. After two years in a row of women winning, we've had three <laughs> women nominated in the last two years. Two, two of them won. And now we're back to complete shutout. But yeah, that's enough. That's enough. It's, yeah. it gave, it gave, it's not like women direct films that much, you know? <laughs> it's not like there are any good films made by women this year that have been in awards conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, no, not at all. It's not like one of them got nominated for Best Picture. It directed itself. It see. did. It did. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Clearly. <laughs> so I we're going to link both of the articles. Um, I, I think they're both very worth reading. And it's good to have a, a perspective on this. You know, there, there are issues with the, like, you know, like you mentioned, there are reasons why the Academy um, investigated the Riceboro nomination, but that it really does feel like this is being used within entertainment journalism. So within critic circles as well, um, and within the industry as a way of scapegoating and avoiding the real conversation that Robert and Clayton and others have raised very clearly, which is this issue of systemic racism. Yeah. Um, the problem is not andrea riceboro but she's going to be made the problem because it's very convenient yep and heaven forbid if she wins if she wins yeah we talked about this i think um if if she wins it's going to be a fucking shit show especially given the the whole michelle yao the michelle yao versus kate blanchett argument which i'm so tired of mm -hmm. um and because first of all both both of those women actually probably all of the women who've been nominated deserve the oscar right so th i think that that's just something to say second of all they have been so public about the fact that they are not campaigning against each other right they are like they are basically like oh we love we love each other like we like each other we mm -hmm. the, we are both good actresses you know all of that stuff and the fact that this has turned into this kind of uh, Yao versus Blanchett is is very embarrassing and I, I think that you know there's so many other political things that are going into this that it's it really has ceased to be about you know who gave the best performance and I couldn't I couldn't tell you who gave the best performance between Michelle Yao and Kate Blanchett because those are two very different roles yeah give them both the Oscar I don't know <laughs> yeah I know it's it's one of those things it's like if you have a ballot how do you say I mean I know what I would do if I did have a ballot but it doesn't necessarily mean that I don't want them both to get it. Exactly. So moving on, let's talk, you know, we we talked about the Oscars, which are not for what, another month. <laughs> <laughs> March 12th, yep. So more than a month. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be there. I, I, I really hope that I... So I'm, I obviously, I always watch from home. I usually get incredibly drunk by about nine o'clock. Um, last <laughs> year, this alcohol, so I will not be drunk. <laughs> last year is the year of the slap. Uh, and, and I remember I even said it online. I was just like, nothing interesting is happening. Why isn't anything <laughs> interesting happened? And then literally within the next five minutes, the it's slap happened. It was, I, I take total responsibility for manifested it. Manifested um, it. <laughs> I hope something interesting happens, but not like that. Yeah. Like something, <laughs> something good, interesting. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't know that. Like they give the Oscar to both Blanchett and Yao. I don't. Some, <laughs> that would be interesting. There was a tie in lead actors once. There was, yeah. yeah. So I, we, we can definitely have that again. Why not? Yeah. It's been like sixty years. I think it's time. <laughs> I think that would be great. Yeah. But so let's talk about some of the potential future Oscar winners. Yeah. Uh, if if there are in fact any, um, Karen, you were at Sundance as we said the last couple of weeks. You got to see a lot of films. What would you like to talk about? Like, your first of all, what are your what were your general impressions of the festival this year? There were a lot of different perspectives uh, on social media and and within the kind of entertainment journalism. But what was your perspective as a person who's actually there? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. This is the I think fifth time I've gone to Sundance as press. When I lived in Utah, I went you know a few times just as a normal person, but um, and had to actually pay for a ticket and wait in line and hope to get in. I always did, but you know, just because you buy a ticket does not guarantee you entry. Um, 
<laughs> things to think about when you're forking over 25 bucks to hope to get to see something <laughs> in Park City. But um, it was interesting this year because they did have a hybrid schedule again. Because, you know, I don't know if anybody knows, but COVID is still a thing and it's still happening. And so this year um, was the first quote unquote fully back um festival i say quote unquote because a lot of people didn't come back they stayed home and watched stuff but this year all the venues were reopened there's one that they didn't use um but all the venues were reopened audiences were welcomed back in person the last couple of years has mostly been online so um so it was fun to to get to be you know in those venues again um that were sometimes not any warmer than outside <laughs> or at least not much but um uh but it was just it was interesting because of the fact that so many especially press people stayed home and got to cover it from home and got access to almost all of the exact same movies that that we did be in person um there was just this weird it was it was a very muted festival like there were still people there was still traffic but the shuttles were almost never crowded. Every time I got on a shuttle, I got a seat, um, which is unheard of, especially in the first weekend of this, you know, 10 day fest. Um, I got, I had a limited badge. I got into everything I wanted to watch. And then it was like, once it was over, you just talked to maybe the couple of people that were sitting around you or else not anybody. And so the festival buzz and the festival hype that we're used to, was really really quiet this year which made it for overall kind of a weird a weird experience I you know I was there with some friends um you know that I went to most of my screenings with and we would talk amongst ourselves but it just it felt like you know I wasn't in line really chatting with people like I normally would be um you know not really talking to a lot of people on the shuttles and things or volunteers even i ran into a couple of the same volunteers and we would kind of catch up on what oh what did you watch oh yeah i saw that that was great but overall it just it felt almost like this really insulated thing where we were kind of if you were there you were kind of isolated from the rest of the world and it was just this really like kind of quiet intimate festival which in some ways was kind of fun but in other ways was a little bit sad. I I mean it's it's interesting to to think about why this this is happening and I I I think that as as we discussed before we started recording actually this issue of the hybrid model um which on the one hand gives people a great deal of access right so mm-hmm. you know people who cannot who could not go to Sundance right can actually see the films and review the films and things like that. And one of the problems with with Sundance is always that it is it's one of the less accessible festivals, yeah. both in terms of um, accessibility, in terms of disability access, but also just in terms of where it takes place. It takes place in January, first of all, um, in a historically cold place. Mm-hmm. Um, that is not necessarily always easy to get to. It is in a major metropolitan area. It isn't a major, it's not a major film hub except as the Sundance Film Festival. Right. So th- it's not like there are a lot of local critics or people, you know, we we talked about if you go to festivals in LA, if you go to festivals in New York or or even in places like Toronto, um, there's a local community that is a pretty big critical community, a pretty big um, film community generally. Sundance doesn't have that. And on the one hand, I think that that could be very beneficial to it and has been beneficial to it. On the other, it's less accessible. Right. Um, so the hybrid model makes it more accessible. It means that people can actually see these films. But then the flip side of that seems to be the um, the festival experience itself. And more importantly, I think, because, you know, at the end of the day, film festivals are about films. Uh, more importantly, the um, the ability of these films to actually gain traction mm-hmm. and to get sold and to get seen. And yeah. the fact that you're not getting that kind of buzz um, because people either, you know, aren't there, the buzz is happening online, you're not getting the same like in-person conversation that that has the potential to be very problematic especially when we're talking about a time period where indie films need a lot of traction Mm -hmm. and they need a lot of attention in order to get that traction and to actually start moving into to you know 
potentially get released into theaters, get picked up by streaming services, et cetera. Yeah. Sundance is a market festival where, um, I mean, some festivals really are just about, hey, screening cool stuff from around the, the country, from around the world, from throughout the year. But Sundance is specifically a film where independence, and that line is getting blurred more and more every year, but where independent films go looking for distribution. They're hoping to sell so that they can find their way to theaters and streaming services later on in the year. And one of the things that typically happens is you front load big premieres the first weekend. So from like, usually Sundance opens on a Thursday night. And so from Thursday to Monday, they have just like all these big premieres and get the casts to come. The directors come and introduce their films. They do, you know, Q and A's, they do parties, they do all kinds of stuff. And what happens then is you pack the theaters and, and usually a lot of these are happening at the Eccles, which is the biggest venue in Park City uh, in terms of number of seats. And so you pack that place with people, you show them this movie, and then they're talking about it the rest of the week, you know, and they're they're on the shuttles. Oh, yeah, I saw this. It was great. Have you seen that? You know, they're talking about it in line. They're talking about it everywhere they go. They're talking about it on social media. And then what happens is those films that are coming, sometimes movies already have distribution before they come to Sundance. Like it happens sometime in between, you know, getting accepted and, and actually showing. Occasionally you have a movie that uh, already has a distributor like way before Sundance ever comes along. But that's that's rare. It's increasing. But um, but mostly it's movies that are looking to get picked up. And so what happens is then they premiere. Everyone's talking about them. And then the the reps from the studios uh, that are there with, you know, cold, hard cash in their hand looking to sell it or spend it. Um, they hear the movies that everyone's talking about and they're like okay i need a meeting with that director i need a meeting with these people the producers whatever and so then they start the bidding and then you end up with these you know auctions for these titles this year it really there were only there was only like one movie that that really happened with because of the fact that so many people were not there and the movies that people were talking about were so few. So it was just like, there are still a bunch of movies that I totally thought were definitely going to get picked up that haven't yet. They're still looking for distribution, which is so surprising to me because some of these are really, really good. And it's just, I don't know. It's it's very strange. It's very strange. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. Uh just for you, I was just curious and we'll, we'll I'll get to talking about some of the movies I saw in a second, but um I was just curious for you watching Sundance kind of play out on Twitter. What were your <laughs> what were your impressions watching it from not there? <laughs> well, I I I did just say, you know, I was actually thinking about this even as as you're talking. I was just like, well, the twi the Twitter world is changing as well, right? As as a result of, you know, some of the things that we've talked about uh the last year. Um, and so, you know, what I see on Twitter and this, this was always true of Twitter, but what I see on Twitter, um, is different from what another person sees, right? Because it's about who I follow. It's about who I'm blocked by, um, <laughs> who I have blocked, uh, you know, so, so there's, there's a very specific way that I think, you know, every, every person on Twitter engages with it, but obviously, you know, I see if, if something begins to get buzz, you see that. Um, you see more and more people tweeting about it, et cetera, it eventually filters through. One of the things that I thought was very interesting, just in terms of the quality of films, right? Regardless of, you know, I, there was definitely not a hype, a festival hype going on that was the same um, as I've seen in previous Sundances. And I'll be interested to see if this carries over to some of the later film festivals that places like Toronto or Cannes, um, if the same kind of hype doesn't get going on social media. Because one of the things that I definitely noticed was, was that lack of, you know, I, as, as I mentioned facetiously before we started recording, the, you know, this is the greatest film in the history of God. Uh, that kind of rhetoric really was not happening on, on Twitter. But in terms of the quality of the films themselves, most of what I saw were people like you and like other people that I follow who are at Sundance or who were watching it um, on watching films online. 
d- literally just saying like, oh, I saw this really great film. Oh, this is a really interesting film. Or, you know, every once in a while, I was just like, oh, I really, you know, everyone seems to like this one. I don't. Um, and you got that a little bit, but for the most part, my impression, right? And this was my impression based on the people that I follow, et cetera. Um, my impression was that this was actually a pretty good festival, that there were a number of films that actually deserve consideration, deserve, as you say, distribution, deserve to be seen. And there wasn't that sensation of like one film or a couple of films overwhelming the rhetoric, overwhelming the the um, the space, right? There, there was more of like, oh, there's some really good things going on. Like, this will be interesting. I'll be interested. That'll be interesting to see. I'll be interested when that comes out. You know, they're, they're those small, I guess it, in that sense, it felt more independent and it felt more like it was about the actual quality of the films themselves versus the the rhetoric and the hyperbole behind them Mm -hmm. yeah that was that was my experience i well and i it was it was good to see you talking about some of that on twitter because um and we you know we messaged a little bit during the festival but i was so busy watching movies i really didn't have time to talk to people it's kind of (laughs) nice because I saw 20 films at Sundance this year and Jesus plus I saw six shorts I watched um I watched the midnight short package um, which had six films in it but um yeah I saw 20 films I was there from Friday to basically Friday through the following um Saturday and saw a lot of movies and it was good um but it was interesting because I was watching, you know, I was seeing some people on Twitter say like, oh, there's nothing good at Sundance this year. And I was like, it's been three days and I haven't seen anything bad yet. (laughs) So I was like, I don't know what anybody's talking about. (laughs) And and that's the thing. And and I, I, I think I said in my, in my way of like, you know, burning all of my bridges with everybody that I've ever (laughs) spoken to is that if you think that this year's Sundance is bad, maybe you're just following miserable people Yeah. because most of what I was seeing was very positive. Every once in a while, there was like a few, like, you know, I didn't like this film, but for the most part, it was very like, you know, hey, this th- there's so many good films this year, mm-hmm. and and so when I saw those people being like, oh, it sounds like Sunday it sucks this year, just like who the fuck are you talking to? <laughs> like, do you, are, are you just like you're just a mis- you just follow miserable people, obviously, because all the people I follow are having a great time. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was great, it was fun. Um, I will say so now. This is where I'll start talking about some of the movies I saw. Um, yes. the biggest seller of the festival was a movie called fair play and uh netflix bought it for 20 million it's i was actually kind of bummed that netflix bought it because i think you know netflix tends to disappear things no matter how much Mm -hmm. they stand behind it like stuff just goes on netflix and kind of just vanishes you know um i was hoping that neon would buy it and they were in the they were in the the bidding wars um along with Searchlight. I know a couple others were too, but ultimately Netflix came up with, with the, the $20 million. But this movie is directed by Chloe Dumont, who uh, this is her first feature, but um, she's come from TV. She directed episodes of shows like Ballers and um, I think Star Trek Discovery, um, uh, Billions. So she's been around TV for a while and this is her first Uh, feature film and this is one that i think people are going to hear that price tag and i think they're going to have maybe some expectations that i don't know if this film lives up to them or not i'm not sure um i thought it was a really great film but it's not like world changing wow yeah it makes sense that they paid 20 million dollars for this movie so i think this is going to be the one film out of sundance this year that people see it and they're just like wait how much did this cost (laughs) i don't know it'll be it'll be interesting but um (laughs) but it's good and what's good about it and you can read my this I, i still have some reviews i'm trying to finish doing but this is one of the ones that i did get to Um, this is a movie that could have just been this like relationship drama about this couple who Mm -hmm. just got engaged, but they have to keep their engagement a secret because they work at the same corporate hedge fund and, um, they're not allowed to date, you know, it's like against corporate policy. And, 
Um, so it could have, you know, and then there's this like promotion that comes up and she gets it and he doesn't. And that is a challenge, you know? And so it could have just been this relationship drama about this couple trying to like figure that out. And this is something that a lot more people are experiencing in, in life, you know, as more women are promoting up in these companies, but Chloe Domont didn't do that. She turned it into a thriller and that was actually such a fun way to do it. And it turns into this, this like, you watch this, this white dude played by Alden Ehrenreich, who is great in it. Um, just watching him unravel as things go on and, um, and just seeing kind of this, it's not quite cat and mouse, but just seeing the way the two of them navigate this situation in a way that is not just a, not just a drama, but really has some like intense stakes to it. I thought it was such a fun choice. And I think this is an entertaining movie. I think it does have some smart things to say, but I think once people actually watch it later in the year when it's on Netflix, I just really don't know what the overall reaction is going to be. So one of the things that I was interested in actually was, was um, when I initially saw your review uh, and, and I think you had even mentioned to me like, oh, here's a, this is a film that you want to watch for, right? This is, this is one that you're going to like. And I was like, that sounds good. And then I saw a number of different responses that did not like the film. <laughs> um, and, and I, I don't want to make generalizations, not having seen the movie, do not know how I'm going to feel about it. Karen and I sometimes feel differently. I will just say most of those people who did not like it were dudes. Mm -hmm. And I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know what that means. Uh, but I, it is one that like, um, based both on your review and on the description, I think it would, and the fact that it's a female director, which is always kind of raises things in my perspective. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I was very entertained by it. I really am looking forward to getting to watch it again. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely do think that men and women are watching this differently, even among the men that I saw that are the men that I know that liked it, um, their reasonings and the things that they liked about it are very different from mine. So <laughs> and what mm -hmm. what men are getting out of this movie is different from what I personally got out of it. So it's going to be interesting. One thing I did not include in my review that I really need to go back and add is a trigger warning because there is a a scene involving an assault that is um i think that it was it was photographed well and fairly in the vein of like not to this extent in brutality but it's similar to how jennifer kent approached it in nightingale where the reaction is not on the perpetrator but on the victim um and and it's not fetishizing or sexualizing the incident at all but uh, that definitely does happen and I need to go back and add that to my review because I think people need to be aware that that mm -hmm. is something that happens in this movie so uh, yeah let's see um, so that was the big seller the other uh, the other movie that sold for almost as much it was just a hair under 20 million went to Apple it's a movie called Flora and Son and this movie is just so nice it's just a nice <laughs> um it's uh it, so John Carney, he's the guy who directed Sing Street and Once and yeah. Begin Again. Yeah. So he does these like just like really pleasant musical movies, you know? Um, and that's what this is. It's this Flora is a single mom, played by Eve Houston, and um she's a single mom who has a teenage son who is just such a little jerk. <laughs> he's just such an ass hates her guts but it's like you also kind of get why he feels kind of shunted between mom and dad who fight they're divorced dad was in a band um thinks he's so cool but he's really just like a dipshit you know <laughs> and uh mom uh flora she finds a guitar that's just like on a scrap heap and she pulls it out gets it fixed up to give to her son but he doesn't care anything about it so she decides, you know what? I'm going to take guitar lessons. And so she finds an online teacher and it's played by, he's played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And um, it's just, it's just really sweet. And watching the two of them get to know each other, watching the way that, the way that their lessons are filmed, because he's in America and she's in Ireland and watching the way that, that um, 
kind of they get to know each other is it was clever and cute and just it's just a sweet movie and that will be going to apple sometime soon oh good yeah so good. yeah so were there were there any others that like maybe that didn't get picked up that you were like oh i really hope that this gets traction eventually yeah um there's one that has not gotten bought yet that i really think if it gets purchased by the right studio this is this is a movie called magazine dreams another one that is very divisive um i think if it gets bought by the right studio with the year that jonathan majors is about to have i think that this could do something for him later on in the year i'm not predicting oscar nominations because we know how the academy is but um it, it you know it could be definitely a movie that finds its way into awards conversations um it's he plays this guy who is basically an incel um which is interesting to see this kind of character as a black man instead of you know we typically see them as white men um and so it's interesting to see that it adds some layers because he you know he lives in a food desert he you know he's out for a run in his own neighborhood and kind of gets a little bit harassed by cops you know he's in the grocery store where he works and makes customers uncomfortable just by existing you know so there's these extra layers uh he's not just this like weird guy who's obsessed with bodybuilding which is part of it but there's just these extra layers that he has to struggle with and deal with because of the fact that he's a black man you know and um and so Jonathan Majors is fantastic in this performance. It, he's basically this guy who works at like his entire life. He he works so that he can afford to, you know, supply his or pay for his his hobby or his you know passion, which is bodybuilding. And his dream is to be on the cover of bodybuilding magazines. And he's obsessed with this one particular bodybuilder. And um, there's so much. You know, there's so much depth that Majors specifically brings to this character that just makes it phenomenal. And I I am just surprised that it hasn't been bought yet. It's it's very strange. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I, I I recognize that name. I've heard some buzz about it and it'll it will probably get picked up, it mm-hmm. seems, especially given given him and, and given the fact that there is there has been buzz about it yeah um but yeah that's that seems pretty surprising as well it sounds interesting though yeah yeah it's really good he is he is really fantastic so um i i just i want people to see it because i want them to see how good he is and what he can do Mm -hmm. you know um i'm just looking to see because a few other things have finally been been bought like in the last couple of days so i'm like just checking to see what else is still waiting um i saw a really sweet i don't know what'll happen with this movie but i saw a really sweet documentary called junam and this one was surprisingly not a lot of people saw it but among the ones that did this was surprisingly a little bit divisive too um it's this uh it's a documentary by this iranian Uh, well she's american she grew up here but her mother and her grandmother are iranian and um so she has a persian background but um her mother came to the united states on a student visa back in 1979 right before the the fall of the shah and then eventually her grandmother uh came to the united states too and so basically this woman sierra she's trying to get to know her roots she's trying to connect with where she came from and she feels this longing for iran she really wants to go and see these places that she occasionally hears her mom and her grandmother talk about um but she's trying to connect with them so that she can understand more about her heritage and kind of fill this this gap that she thinks that she feels is missing and so it's just a really sweet documentary it's funny um it's really funny watching the way like her mother will get mad at her because like, oh, look at how she's speaking to me. But then we'll turn right around and talk to her own mother the same way with absolutely no sense <laughs> of, of irony there. <laughs> so um, so it's just it's cute. And then there's just really sweet things like when she gets when Sierra gets the transcripts back because her mother, her, I'm sorry, her grandmother still mostly only speaks Farsi. And so there's a and she does and Sierra does not speak Farsi. She's learning it throughout the film. 
But uh, when she gets the transcripts back and sees some of the things that her grandmother had been saying throughout the whole experience that she didn't know, it's just it's just so sweet and like it's just this way that she gets to know her grandmother in a different way that she never did before so i really liked the film a lot um huh that's interesting yeah i I thought it was i thought it was really good um it's a it's another first feature this is another thing about sundance this year is they always do you know they always have a pretty great slate of first-time filmmakers this year Mm -hmm. 70 percent of their first timers were women wow yeah yeah i mean that's that's fan that's fantastic mm-hmm. and it's in its own right and that inc- that includes the mediocre films like right. even the <laughs> mediocre ones women should be allowed to make mediocre movies as well <laughs> exactly let women make mediocre movies <laughs> men get to do it all the time <laughs> and then get like million dollar contracts <laughs> uh-huh. yeah exactly or billion i don't know anyway yeah. Yeah. Um, there was one other movie that I saw that ha- it, worldwide it's um, it's under Sony, but it's not it doesn't have U.S. distribution yet. And maybe Sony Pictures will will do something with it. I don't know. I'm kind of waiting to hear. And that is um, a movie called The Accidental Getaway Driver. Which oh, that's is- one I did not hear about. Okay. Yeah. It, so this is based on a true story that happened just a few years ago, basically in my own backyard. Like this is when I was living in Orange County in California. This happened. I remember um, I never heard the end of the story. I never knew how this went. So watching the movie was interesting because I didn't know what was going to happen, but I definitely remembered the situation. So basically these three men pretty violent guys uh broke out of the orange county jail they were all awaiting trial for different crimes and they got you know they got people on the inside to help them people on the outside like it was this big um jailbreak situation and plot and then what happened was um so in this particular part of orange county there's an area a neighborhood called little saigon And they have like a little newspaper. And so there was this sweet old man who used his own car basically as an Uber, but he wasn't registered through Uber. He just had it, you know, like had an ad in the little paper. I'm the, I'm a taxi driver. Call me up. Here's my number. And so one night really late, he gets a phone call from someone who's like, Hey, I will pay double your rates. If you just drive me from here to there. And he's really reluctant, but he goes and picks them up and they end up kidnapping him and forcing him to drive them to different places and then they end up basically just keeping him for days and days and days and um it's it's a really the way that the film itself is done it's not just like it's not just a thriller that's like oh my gosh this guy's kidnapped he needs to get out of it it's not like that it's um it's a (laughs) kind of the flip of fair play where it could have been just a thriller and instead it's sort of a relationship drama too <laughs> um <laughs> actually thought uh, just as i was talking i was like oh yeah i just realized that that's so funny um but uh but yeah so it, it you know it gets into him really trying to connect with his kidnappers and um and also it addresses some of the the traumas in his own life because he was a vietnamese immigrant you know and he Mm-hmm. A lot of his family came here um, early on when people were were leaving Vietnam and coming to the United States. And so they were able to find prosperity when they got here because they came early enough. But he came later and never really was able to to make it. You know, he was always struggling. And so it gets into to that experience. And it's just a really... Um, I don't know. I just I really liked this one, probably partly because I felt so connected to it because I was like, oh, I know exactly where that market is. I've been in that <laughs> store, you, you know, but also partly just because I, I'm a sucker for these um, kind of introspective relationship redemption type of, of mm-hmm. movies, too. So especially when you're dealing with uh, elderly people facing um, not just challenges, but kind of dealing with something really hard while also looking back on the, the the difficulties and the bad choices that they've made in their own lives 
Interesting. Well, that that one sounds really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I hope it gets picked up. I think it will. I I did want to ask you about another another film that you, in fact, texted me about and, and were saying, like, this was supposed to be a rom-com, but I think it's a thriller. <laughs> um, yes. I want to know. So what what were your thoughts on on Cat Person? This is the film that's adapted from the um, New Yorker article mm-hmm. right a new yorker short story that has a, that has a lot of baggage attached to it to begin with um yeah. but i i was wondering about if you had that thoughts on it you know what you felt about the this adaptation <laughs> so here's the funny thing i knew about that article and i had read it like years ago when it first years ago like eight, i don't know five or six years ago when it came out but for some reason when i heard the title of this movie and i just i saw a picture of Amelia Jones and Nicholas Braun and I heard people kind of vaguely mention something about it I didn't connect that it had anything to do with the short story and I didn't read about it (laughs) so I completely missed that so I was just like oh cat person that sounds cute you know I was thinking I guess I was thinking of the movie must love dogs maybe (laughs) (laughs) which is definitely a (laughs) rom-com so i just didn't even think anything of it and then i'm like watching this movie and i was seriously five minutes into it and i'm like wait a minute um this is not funny and it's not romantic (laughs) so um i overall i thought it was actually pretty well done i i liked it i think that um you know it definitely expands on the story because the short story um ends kind of abruptly after a particular incident that is just uncomfortable it's not i don't know i think there's probably lots of different interpretations of it but um the movie goes far beyond that the movie definitely turns this into a um a a a thriller and a pretty fraught one and it it ends at a much different place than the short story did by the way this is directed by Susanna Fogel who directed the spy who dumped me which we both love yes Um, (laughs) which maybe that's another reason why I thought this was going to be funny (laughs) because she also co-wrote book smart so (laughs) like I just was not prepared um she she sucked you in there (laughs) she did she did but you know what? I like Susanna Fogel and I liked this. And even though I personally had some, um, I wasn't completely on board with the way that this, this ends. I really enjoyed it. I think the way that she lays out um, the story, the way she builds the tension, the way that she um, really does make you constantly guess and question, like, am I overthinking this? Is that person really being as weird as I think they are like she really taps into that 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 uncertainty that so many of us have when we're dealing with someone that we don't really know especially in a dating situation and you know the way that we overthink things but then we overthink it so much that we start to worry that we're underthinking it (laughs) you know and I think she Mm -hmm. captures that pretty well so I I enjoyed this I thought it was a lot of fun I also uh i also was just it was good to see amelia jones in in something different you know i've seen her obviously Mm -hmm. she was in coda last year um i saw her in two movies at sundance and the i thought she was much better in this one i thought it was better suited for her the other one she's in is fairyland which is also a good movie um but i didn't think she was quite right for that film but this one um i thought she was i thought she was good nicholas braun is good it's fun to see him break out of the um uh cousin greg severance or not severance um um succession uh character a bit so um yeah and then geraldine Viz- Viswanathan um she plays the roommate she's she's really good too i love her so it just uh i don't know i i enjoyed this it was not what i thought it was going to be but uh, that turned out to be a good thing i think <laughs> good <laughs> I definitely had some questions and there were definitely some things that I was like, uh, I probably would have handled that a little differently, but overall I enjoyed it. Cool. Well, was there anything that you missed that you wanted to see that you didn't get a chance to, or that you, or that you did see and were disappointed by? <laughs> um, you know, there's always a little bit of 
both of those. Um, mm-hmm. that's, let's see. Um, one of the big ones that I wanted to see and didn't get to was it's actually going to be in theaters pretty soon so I'll, I'll get to watch it pretty soon and that is um polite society which um then yesterday i was watching knock at the cabin in the theater and uh they showed a trailer for it so i was like oh good this is coming out even sooner than i thought so i'm not gonna miss out on it completely but um it's the way i heard it described is it's sort of like like a martial arts version of a Jane Austen story. Oh, I know. I've seen the trailer for this as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know. That sounds fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I definitely want to see that one. It's um, yeah. It, Anita Manzor is the director and mm. um, and uh, yeah, I, I I don't really know much about it other than that. It just looked like a really fun movie. I know there's something about um, a girl who's basically trying to stop her older sister from having to get married. And um, yeah, there's some martial arts involved and it's all women <laughs> kicking ass. And I <laughs> sign me up for that. Yeah. I, I heard someone describe it as, as a Jane Austen fight club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay, that was <laughs> it. That. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, there was another movie I kept hearing about, which is called Cassandra, which stars, um, I think this is the one with, um, gail garcia bernal yeah um and he plays a gay amateur wrestler this is based on a true story um this is a lucha libre story which i'm not like super big into wrestling i don't know that world at all but i heard really good things about the film so um so i really did want to see that one um just trying to think what else um other than that i feel like most of what i got to see i i you know i really want to i got to see the new nicole hall of center you hurt my feelings with uh, julia louis dreyfus and tobias menzies i loved it thought it was really really good oh good um yeah i got to see Corey finley's new movie he's the one that directed thoroughbreds a couple years oh, ago yeah mm-hmm. um and both of these already they came to the festival with distribution so mm-hmm. Um, but that one is called Landscape with Invisible Hand, which is such a weird title. I almost skipped the movie, but my friend said, hey, Corey Finley directed it. And I went, oh, OK, I'll go. And I'm glad I did. I loved it. It's like this weird little sci fi movie um, about aliens who have basically arrived. And instead of fighting with us and trying to kill us, they take over our economy and um, <laughs> which seems more realistic to me. I don't know. Anyway, no, it's a really good, um, it's a really good metaphor and a commentary on colonialism and capitalism and uh, how the kids are gonna save us all. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, yeah, I really liked that. Tiffany Haddish plays the mom in it, and I recent issues with Tiffany Haddish aside or potential ones aside i will say it is nice to see what she's able to do when she has a director who knows how to direct her Hmm. um because i've seen her in stuff where i'm just like oh i i know other people felt differently i hated what paul schrader did with her in card counter i hated card counter anyway but i really thought she was not good in that but seeing her in this one it's like oh she's acting and she's doing really well and she's doing some dramatic stuff that's working so um yeah but um yeah uh I'm trying to think what else what else i wanted to mention um were there any other movies you heard about that i haven't really talked about no i think that you've covered most of the ones that like i had questions about i think fair play was big on the nicole hall of center um no it's i mean it sounds like it was actually a really good festival that there were a lot of interesting things and a lot of worthwhile films um and even even ones that were interesting to see but may not necessarily have been worthwhile yeah yeah um, that's the thing is like i didn't dislike anything well no no i didn't think anything i saw was bad iris Sachs had a new movie called passages i did not enjoy it it was but i know that this is a good movie it's really well performed and I know a lot of people are going to love it. For me, it was just so chaotic and frustrating. I really mm-hmm. I really struggle with watching men 
anybody, but particularly men, make an absolute mess of their lives and the lives of people that they're closest to, and then just expect people to just accept them anyway. I struggle with that. And that's Mm -hmm. exactly the plot of that movie. And (laughs) so it was like, yeah, this is really good. These actors are great, but oh my gosh, I want to punch this guy in the <laughs> There are far too many films like that. Honestly, when you you pause, you pause there. I struggle really with watching men. And, and then I was like, is that, is, is she, is, is that it? <laughs> and I was just like, yep, same, same. Sometimes yeah. just like I do. I also sometimes really struggle with watching men. I'm just like, they're just so, they're just there being, being men. Yeah. Well, this movie in particular, it's about this guy who, men? yeah, yeah, he's he's just a man. He's a man who exists, and he's a man. Um, but no, he's he's married to Ben Wishaw. Like he's gay, and he's married to a man. And then he meets this woman who just kind of rocks his world, and he goes off and has an affair with her. And then he comes home and he tells his husband, and expects his husband to just be like, "Hey, that's awesome." And his husband's just like, "What? <laughs> what are you talking about?" And then he decides he wants to go be in a relationship with this girl and leave his husband. But he wants to be able to come back to his husband anytime he feels like it. It's like, no, stop it. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Oh. Proof that men can ruin shit, even for other men. Yep, it's true. It's true. Yeah. But anyway, so, yeah. I guess that's kind of refreshing to see a gay guy be just as toxic as a straight man. Yeah, watching him get to be messy and toxic and frustrating and, again, really, really great performance. He was fantastic. Mm-hmm. It just for myself personally, it was just like, dude, <laughs> stop it. There, there are films <laughs> like that, I think. Yeah. So any any final thoughts about this year's Sundance? Anything else that you wanted to to shout out or... You know, I saw some great, I, I just, I, when you see that many movies, there's just so many, all right, yeah. always stuff to, to talk about. I saw some great documentaries. Um, there's one that's going to be talked about a lot. It's going to be, I think it's, well, it's a frontline documentary, so I'm not sure who's going to be airing it, but um, probably just PBS, but uh, it's called 20 Days in Mariupol, and it's about the early days mm-hmm. of Russia invading Ukraine last year, and oh my gosh, it's harrowing. It's really hard to watch, but it's basically the behind the scenes of how we saw some of the footage that we saw coming out of that city um, wow. early on to really understand the scope of what Russia was doing. So it's difficult. It is really challenging to watch, but I highly encourage anybody as soon as it comes out, um, force yourself to sit through it and really experience and understand the scope of this because it's it's really good. And then there's a three-part series that's going to be hitting showtime very soon which is called murder and bighorn and it's about the missing and murdered indigenous women and uh, how bighorn county montana is like the highest you know um percentage i guess um of instances of women going missing in the united states and um really well laid out i thought i did feel like it got a little bit repetitive toward the end but uh it really lays out the case of how this has been going on for so long and then sort of what the tipping point was to get this finally to to come into the consciousness of people outside of this very specific area and this community so um yeah i think it's really good i think it's really important i think people need to learn i learned so much about um just the statistics of of how many women go missing and the circumstances and what's happening and some of the reasons that this is happening and so i think people need to to check that one out too that'll be on showtime pretty soon i think interesting yeah yeah i think i think that i've heard about that one too yeah good stuff Mm. so well it sounds like overall that it was a pretty good sundance like that is the impression that i'm getting from you definitely yeah um so I, finally, let's let's just close this out with anything interesting that you've been watching this week. <laughs> uh, I saw Knock at the Cabin. Ah, I, yes. Like, I I am I will watch every twenty million dollar B movie that M Night Shyamalan wants to make. <laughs> I just think they're so fun. I don't necessarily always think they're good or particularly deep or insightful, but I enjoy the crap out of them, and I 
thoroughly enjoyed this one too. I'm really sorry for calling you stupid online then. <laughs> <laughs> You're not stupid. You're not stupid, Karen. You just have terrible taste in movies. That's all. Um, I, I haven't seen a, a Knock at the Cabin, so I, I will not make a general, again, will not make a generalization about that. No, I will not reference that particular film, but I will say that all of M. Night Shyamalan's films are stupid. Uh, <laughs> you are allowed to have that very incorrect opinion, if you would like. Very, to. very correct opinion. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I, I have heard some people who have read the the book, which is by um, Paul, Paul Tremblay, The Cabin at the End of the Road or something yeah. like that. Cabin at the End of the World. Um, and and that there have been some complaints about some of the changes that Shyamalan made, which might be fair, might not necessarily, because a film is a film and a book is a book. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I found it interesting that there were some of the the criticisms that I've read of that film have been primarily about the way that it's it changed the plot of the the book, um, which I found sort of interesting. Yeah, I haven't read it, so I I don't know, but mm -hmm. I am curious about it. He he seemed fine with the movie so but i mean who knows it's getting more attention to his book so yeah not. exactly <laughs> uh well good it's good to know that you can still be wrong about things um uh well i i just was recently watching moon age daydream which is the the david bowie documentary oh, yeah. which um came out last year and then I've been waiting to see and then finally was like I'm just going to go ahead and rent it it really is a fascinating film I think you have to like David Bowie obviously um but it is one of the least linear musical documentaries I've seen uh in the sense that there are no talking heads there's no like there's no one who is you know explaining anything um it's not really it's not even really about, you know, the, it's about the different periods in Bowie's career, but it isn't even really about that. It's very focused on the music and imagery of it and, and kind of the persona that he built for himself, the multiple personas that he built for himself. Um, and it's it's a really fascinating film. It's, it's available to rent right now, and I believe that it will be on HBO Max in March. So oh, cool. very, if you haven't seen it, very worth seeing, especially if you like David Bowie or like that era of rock. Yeah, I I had missed it when it was out in theaters before, and I've been wanting to see it, so I definitely will it check is, it out. It's very much worth it. Yes. Um. So I think that is going to close us out for this week for our return. Uh, we will of course be back next week, and as always, we thank our lovely patrons who continue to support us and who recently got a bonus a Sundance bonus episode in which we talked about Heather's. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed that. If you did or if you didn't, please let us know. Um, and our patrons, of course, include Ali, Brian, Connor, Estefania, Heather, James, Kathleen, Cariata, Matt, Michelle, Monty, Nanina, Robert, Robert, Steve, Sharon, Tao, and Will. Um, and I believe that we also have added a new patron. We'll give them a shout out next week as well. Thank you so much, guys, for continuing to support us. And, uh, and if you want to be one of their number, our Patreon is patreon.com slash citizen dame. You do get bonus episodes. You get you do get fun little things. And uh, and we're gonna continue to try to bring more more content here in 2023. Uh if you want to just support us with a couple of dollars, we do have a ko-fi, ko-fi.com slash citizen dame. We also have a PayPal, which you can um link directly to on our website. We have a donate button on there if you want to just like kick us a few dollars that way. And it's always really helpful to, to keep the lights on and to keep our stuff hosted. Um, our website is citizendamepod.com, where you can read all of Karen's many Sundance reviews. She has some great ones up there, including some of the films that she talked about, some of the films that she didn't talk about. And it sounds like you're going to have a few more coming as well. Yep. Uh, and you can also email us. We are citizendamepod at gmail.com and you can get in touch with us on the socials. We are on Twitter and Instagram at citizendamepod. Um, still on Twitter. We might be on Mastodon at some point at uh, <laughs> citizendamepod at mastodon.social. And we also have our letterbox, which now includes our letterbox HQ. Uh, that's at citizendame and you will have lists and links to articles and all sorts of fun stuff. So definitely check that out. And of course, you can follow us individually. Karen, where are you? I am on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at Karen M. Peterson. 
And I am on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at LH Business. Thank you so much for listening, and we will talk to you guys later. Bye.